my lab is, is particularly interested in, in how mechanisms that regulate hematopoietic stem cells change with age and how this change, how this shapes the biology of leukemias at different ages. Um, and, and my particular passion then is, is focused on pediatric cancers and pediatric leukemias. So uh, just a, a couple pieces of quick clinical background before I dive into the data. Um, there are two big flavors of pediatric leukemia that we have to deal with and a few minor types, but I'm going to talk about um, one subtype called AML. So the, the, the two flavors that we have, acute lymphoblastic leukemia and acute myeloid leukemias, I think uh, sort of exemplify some of our greatest successes and also some of our biggest challenges that still remain in pediatric cancer. So ALL is a great success story. Um, in this day and age, if a child is diagnosed with ALL, over 80% of them will survive. For specific subtypes of leukemia, well over 90% of them will survive, uh, whereas this disease was nearly uniformly fatal you know, 40 or 50 years ago. And you know those those advances have come through you know kind of a product of clinical research and then basic science that has led us to new innovative immunotherapies that we can then apply to patients who even have chemotherapy resistant disease. But unfortunately, AML has been a bit more of a struggle, and that's for a number of reasons. First of all, the chemotherapy backbones that we're using are the same ones that were being used 40 or 50 years ago. Um, it's it's some combination of a drug called cytarabine and another one called donorubicin or some other anticycline. And just to give you a perspective, even now our current open pediatric phase three trial for AML nationwide compares one formulation of this cytarabine and anthracycline to another formulation of cytarabine and anthracycline. And it's a little bit conceptually frustrating to not be able to uh, think a little deeper about the problem and identify specific mechanisms. Um, we have made some improvements in terms of identifying you know, who's going to be at the highest risks of relapse based on the genetic profiles of their leukemias. Um, and that's through pretty extensive sequencing projects. Bone marrow transplants have certainly gotten safer um, and with, with better donor selection than we've had in, in past years. And then we've also gotten better at assessing response to therapy, so a technique called minimal residual disease where we can look at it. But for all of those advances, you know, I'd say that there's a substantial percentage of patients where we look at their mutation profiles and, and you already know where things are headed and it's not going to be good. So um, we've gotten better sometimes at quantifying the risk. We're not quite as good at knowing what to do about it when you've got really high risk patients. And I'd add to this that there's this problem where, you know, it's, you know, when we classify a leukemia as being a FLT3 ITD positive leukemia or a 98 translocated leukemia or whatever, it's, it's a little bit derivative to, to just name the one mutation because mutations actually interact together. And that's what I'm going to tell you about today. They, they interact. There's a lot of genetic diversity. And so predicting how patients are going to behave and what therapies they need are going to be uh, shaped heavily, not just by one or two mutations, but the combinations in aggregate. So what do I mean when they say that the leukemias are changing with age? Well, pediatric leukemias, um, this is work from a, a a project called the Target Project, which is a pediatric sequencing project. We found that you know pediatric a majority of pediatric cancers are, are driven by something called fusion proteins. So large structural variations, a chromosomal break, and then reform with another piece of chromosome create proteins that shouldn't otherwise exist in nature. And when that happens, that fundamentally reprograms the preleukemic cell and ultimately the leukemia cell. Um, so about 70% of infants and young children who have AML carry these mutations. The contrast that to what you can see here in the adult population where only about you know, less than 10% of them are driven by fusions. We're looking at genetically fundamentally different leukemias even though they look the same under the microscope when you're comparing it to adults and children. The adult cancers instead are driven by a lot of you know, single nucleotide variants and small focal mutations that disrupt stem cell regulators and other signaling proteins. Um, you know, it's, it's a little bit more of a death by a thousand cuts type of model for leukemia evolution um, where you superimpose aging and, and, and mutation acquisition leading to leukemias. And so when you're looking at these genetically distinct profiles, you know, that's, that suggests that there's got to be fundamental differences in the leukemias that are going to necessi necessitate differences in therapies. And as I said, again, these, these somewhat over simplify the problem because we're looking not just at individual mutations driving the leukemia, but also combinations of mutations. So that's what I'm going to talk to you uh, primarily today is, is what can we infer when we start looking at combinations of pediatric specific mutations and comparing to them how they comparing that to how they shape the cell fates in the, the setting of adult 
uh, biased mutations. There's a lot that we could pick from. So for example, these pediatric initiating mutations, these fusions, there's MLL fusions, which are probably, and, and in these RUNCs1, RUNCs1T1s are amongst the most common. I'm gonna to talk to you about NUP98 fusions today because these are particularly high risk. Um, and then I'll talk about how they combine with mutations that are a little less temporally restricted. You find it in both age uh, groups. And then I'm gonna be comparing the biology of those leukemias to the biology of leukemias that you see um, more commonly in adults and adult spe uh, specific uh, mutation patterns. And we wanna understand then how these combinations of mutations might create diversity amongst patients, amongst leukemia cells within a given leukemia, and then across the age spectrum. And the primary questions that I wanna ask are, does a common driver mutation, so in this case I'm picking the FLT3 internal tandem duplication, which I'll tell you about a little bit more in a second. Does it have similar or distinct effects on gene expression and gene regulation and ultimately cell fate and transformation when you combine it with a pediatric type uh, initiating mutation as compared to an adult biased initiating mutation? And very importantly, can you unmask vulnerabilities in one context that aren't necessarily apparent in another uh, context? So are there emergent properties of cells that you can't predict by looking at the FLT3 ITD mutation or you can't predict by looking at an UP98 mutation, but you stick those two together and now new vulnerabilities emerge that we should be attacking. So as I said, I'll be focusing on, on a couple specific combinations, the NUP98 and FLT3-ITD combination, and then I'm looking at FLT3-ITD co uh, combined with RUNX1 as well. So FLT3-ITD stands for FLT3 internal tandem duplication. What this is, is it's a mutation that extends the intracellular domain of FLT3, uh, which is a, a tyrosine kinase, and, and it hyperactivates it and makes it ligand independent. Um, it's found in about 20% of both pediatric and adult leukemias, a, um, a pediatric and adult AML, so it's not age-restricted to the same extent that some of the other mutations we're looking at are. It's associated with worse survival, um, and a couple of key points. One is that it doesn't drive leukemia by itself. If you have mice or, or cells that just have a FLT3 internal tandem duplication, you get some changes in hematopoiesis and what look like pre-malignant uh, changes, but it's not sufficient to join, to drive an AML. And it's usually actually acquired late in the clonal evolution of the leukemias. There is a, a, a fairly extensive body of work on how it cooperates with other uh, specific mutations. So Ross Levine has shown that it can interact with TET2 mutations uh, in adults to reprogram the epigenomes and uh, activate genes that you wouldn't necessarily find with each mutation alone. Uh, my own group has looked at how it interacts with the, protein, uh, with the mutations in a gene called RUNX1 uh, using a model that was originally developed in Adam Mead's lab. And then Brian Huntley just recently published Again, similar studies looking at how it interacts with mutations in a gene called MPM1. And what's striking about these is that the, the target genes that are coming on cooperatively, meaning these are genes that are getting activated when you have both mutations together, but not either mutation alone, they'll tend to overlap, which suggests that the FLT3 internal tandem duplication might be activating what I would call a common core of target genes to, to drive the final steps of transformation. But these programs always looked at, um, at adult-like mutations, and nobody's actually gone and looked to see what happens in a pediatric context. And so that's what we were aiming to do. Um, the, the, pediatric, the, the representative pediatric fusion that I'll talk to you about is called a NUP98 translocation. So this is a chromosome, and this, this is a, a, a translocation that creates a number of different fusions that all kind of behave similarly, where, uh, so NUP98 gets a bunch of C-terminal fusion partners, and Regard, irrespective of which partner uh, you've got, it, they tend to localize to Hox gene loci and basically recruit cofactors that activate Hox genes that then can reprogram the myeloid progenitor cells and make them into leukemia cells. These are devastating mutations. So this falls into what, uh, the class of patient where when we see this, you, you know you're headed for a bad outcome. Um, survival's less than 10% at three years. It accounts for over 50% of what we would consider chemotherapy-resistant AML. Um, but again, this is a mutation that cannot cause AML by itself. It needs cooperating mutations, and about 50% of NUP98 translocations have a cooperating FLT3 ITD. So uh, the last mutation that I'm going to throw into this mix is these, these, these more adult-biased RUNX1 mutations. Uh, this is a transcription factor that regulates hematopoiesis and hematopoietic lineage commitment. The mutations that you typically find in adult patients are loss of function mutations that affect the, the DNA binding domains or the transactivation domain. And then what I'm just showing you here is just how 
you know, these are about 10% of the adults. Um, in the adolescent and young adult uh, population, you can see some RUNX1 mutations. They're basically not found at all in young children. So they do interact with the 3ITD, but in a completely different age spectrum. And what we wanted to do then is just basically see if we generated mouse models that carried different combinations of these mutations, could we compare and contrast the cooperative activities of each mutation? Um, I'm going to summarize just a couple quick pieces of data before I get into all of the gene regulation, and that's to say that when we look at the basically hematopoiesis in these mice, there are some differences. So there's some progenitor expansion that you, with the FLT3ITD RUNX model that you don't see to the same extent with the FLT3ITD NUP98 model. There's some differences in self-renewal, but if you just take a, a global view at hematopoiesis, there aren't, aren't huge changes. But then when you start looking at gene regulation, some really profound differences emerge. So what I'm showing you here on the right, actually this is a principal component analysis just of bulk RNA-seq performed with multipotent progenitors taken from either you know, uh, wild type mice or single mutants or compound mutants where we just looked then at, at the gene expression profiles and we identified the genes that were differentially expressed in the, the ITD RUNX mice as compared to the ITD NUP98. In this case, it's a HOXD13 fusion. And you can see that there's virtually no overlap in terms of the genes that are getting activated between these two progenitor populations, even though they share a common mutation. And if you actually quantify that, and we can actually go and select the genes that we're calling cooperative targets, so the genes that are actually significantly elevated in the double mutants compared to the single mutants, the FLT3ITD is basically activating a completely different slate of cooperative target genes, depending on whether it cooperates with a RUNX1, adult biased RUNX1 mutation, as compared to a pediatric biased NUP98 translocation. We also looked at the epigenome level. So, you know, genes are regulated by promoter and enhancer elements. Um, and you can identify these through, you know, a variety of techniques. So a taxic, for example, can help you identify open chromatin regions that often identify, associate with enhancer elements or, or promoter elements. Um, we basically downscaled ChIP-seq um, using a technique that was developed um, uh, by, by other groups called chipmentation. We applied this technique to sorted, you know, we could do this on about 20 or 30,000 sorted uh, progenitor cells and use it to identify uh, histone modifications that were associated with either primed or active enhancers. So the, this K4-ME1 peak um, is associated just with, with primed enhancers. And then histone H3K27 acetylation is associated with active enhancers. And so we wanted to see whether there are enhancer elements that are basically differentially recruited um, when you had a combination of these mutations. And again, what you can see is that, first of all, we could identify enhancers that were activated when you had a, specifically when you had a FLT3ITD and NUP98 HOXD13 interaction. And we could identify enhancers that were specifically activated when you had a FLT3ITD and, and RUNX1 mutation interaction. And again, these cooperative programs really didn't, didn't overlap at all. So even though you're, you're, you're sharing a mutation, the effects on epigenome regulation are different. So um, what might be, you know, we, we were looking specifically then, if there's differences, what are those differences? Could we find unifying pathways? And I'm going to show you the data that primarily focuses on the FLT3ITD and NUP98 HOXD13 cooperation. The thing that really stood out is we saw hyperactivation of type 1 interferon target genes in these progenitors um, that we were not seeing to anywhere near the same extent with either mutation alone. Um, this heat map shows it a different way. We've taken, a, a, in this case, a, uh, an interferon target gene set that we'd identified in a cell stem cell paper that we published a couple of years prior. And we just wanted to see whether that gene set was actually activated in, in these different progenitors. And you can see it's very highly active in the ITD nup 98s If you use gene set enrichment analysis to, to formally quantify this, I just want to call your attention to these two gene set enrichment analysis plots where you're seeing very high activity in the compound mutant relative to either single mutant in the FLT3 ITD nup 98 HOXD13 mice. But rather strikingly, when you actually look at regulation of these pathways in a FLT3ITD RUNX mouse, the pathway is actually suppressed. So you're getting a completely opposite effect when you have a, a different cooperating profile. So bulk RNA-seq is nice in that it's, it's cheaper and quicker to perform and it requires less computational expertise, but it doesn't really give you a really deep insight into how cell states are reprogrammed because when you're when we're doing this we're assuming that the markers that we use for flow cytometry are going to be consistent across the different genotypes and that what we're calling a multipotent progenitor or a hematopoietic stem cell might not change across the different genotypes and 
we had this idea that perhaps that's not the right approach and that maybe when you have mutations interacting, you're not just changing hematopoiesis along a normal hematopoietic project, uh, trajectory. So it's not like you're just blocking differentiate, differentiation and getting accumulation of some progenitor. Perhaps we're getting emergent cell types so that um, if you have sort of a, you know, a FLT3 ITD and a, and a 98 translocation, you know, maybe those cells are sort of coloring outside the lines. They're not even falling within a normal hematopoietic trajectory. And to really resolve that, um, we needed to, to move to the single cell level and use the transcriptomes to, to really identify the cells and establish an identity. And so we did that in this case using a lot of different genotypes. And just a quick housekeeping point where you're seeing these deltas, what we've done is we, we kind of stumbled across this. We didn't know this going in, but the, the, the FLIT3ITD ITD allele, knocking allele that we were using, had retained a, a PGK neocassette. Um, and when we were working with these mice, we were finding that they wouldn't, you'd cross to the, to the NUP98 HOXD13 and they wouldn't progress on to get leukemia. And that was a little bit troublesome because it had been published before. Um, but we found that the allele we were using had retained this PGK Neo cassette. And when we crossed, uh, deleted it with, with a Cree, it, now we were hyperactivating the, the FLT3 ITD a little bit more and you could push it onto leukemia. So we did all of these analyses now using sort of a, a weaker FLT3 ITD allele and a more elevated FLT3 ITD allele to give even a little bit more nuance to it. And then we performed single cell RNA seq. We actually performed site seq so that we could then superimpose surface marker barcodes. Um, for specific subpopulations as if you were looking at it under a flow cytometer and, and really see how hematopoiesis was changing. And there's a few things that I want to call your attention to. So first of all, um, this is our wild type, okay? And so using the surface marker barcodes, we could identify the hematopoietic stem cells. We could identify, you know, the next step down the hierarchy and the multipotent progenitors and, we, and, and you know, more committed myeloid progenitors, more committed erythroid progenitors within the lineage negative kit positive fraction of the bone marrow of these mice. And this, we see this every time we do, um, do any single cell experiments with normal wild type cells. You can see these different trajectories shaping out. And so this is what I would call my normal hematopoietic product trajectory. Everything in gray is coming from a different genotype here, okay? When you have a FLT3 ITD or that FLT3 ITD delta allele, what we see is expansion of this MPP population. They're all clustering together. Um, you can see they're, they're similarly blue. That's at cluster 26. And that that cluster is just expanding, but it's actually working within the context of normal hematopoiesis. You've just got a little bit of a differentiation block and expansion of that population. But when you have a NUP98 translocation, first of all, hematopoiesis is broken. Um, it's, uh, you, you get this new population forming out here that doesn't look anything like any normal hematopoietic progenitor. And more importantly, when we actually then superimpose the FLT3 ITD delta mutation, you completely rewire hematopoiesis. And this doesn't look at all like a normal hematopoietic population. It's just an emergent population. And you can see that this is really specific to this allele combination. Um, we're only seeing, you know, it's accounting for, you know, uh, well over, like, I think these two clusters together, 15 and, and 33, account for about 90% of the cells in these, these 98 foot 3 ITD delta mice. And again, compare that to what happens when, um, even when we superimpose our RUNX1 mutation, Again, it's strikingly, we're, we're functioning within the context of normal hematopoiesis when you have a FLT3 ITD and RUNX1 mutation cooperating. So pediatric bias mutations, you create a new emergent population of cells that doesn't look anything like a normal hematopoietic progenitor. Adult-like mutations, you're basically reprogramming normal hematopoiesis to expand a, a progenitor population. And then again, you can see those, those, that's, those are just the statistics to make it look good. And um, I, what I'm just showing you here is that, that you know, there's these radically different uh, you know, cell states that we're seeing. But if we were just to look at this by flow cytometry, they'd have pretty similar surface marker phenotypes. This is basically populations as we'd assign them based on the site-seq barcodes. Okay, so again, what's special about this population? Well, a couple things. One is that we were able to isolate it. So, um, you know, you can see if, if I'm telling you that all of those surface marker barcodes are not informative, we needed to find some barcodes that were so we could actually prove that it's truly a pre AML cell. And so we went and looked at what was expressed in it, and we found that there was high expression of a protein called CD317 on the surface. Um, we could isolate it by phenotype and do limit dilution transplants. And you can see here marked enrichment of, of the transplantable population within that CD317 positive lineage negative kit positive population. And essentially, every mouse that we transplanted that actually successfully engrafted went on to develop AML. Um, the second thing is that it's, again, very strongly enriched for interferon signaling. 
And then this is my favorite thing. The, the reviewers asked for this, and I'm, I'm glad we're going to be able to deliver. When we actually start looking at it in fully transformed human AMLs, this, this pattern is conserved. So what I'm showing you here is, is a technique called gene set variant analysis, where we look at expression of the signatures in, in fully transformed murine leukemias first. You can see that um, you know, these, these, these NUP98, HOXD13, FLT3 ITD specific signatures are retained in the fully transformed mouse leukemias. And then when we look at the pediatric data set, so this is a combination of Target and St. Jude data, you see enrichment of this signature specifically in the NUP98 translocated leukemias. When we look at the FLT3 ITD positive leukemias in pediatrics, we see activation of this signature. We don't see it in the TCGA data from adults. This is a pediatric specific vulnerability potentially. So how is interferon-1 potentiating the, the uh, leukemia, or is it potentiating the leukemia? Well, we went back and did some more site seek this time on mice that lacked interferon-alpha receptor. You can see all of this was done actually without that delta allele, so the, the changes aren't quite as pronounced. But we can identify, again, an emergent population, number 19 here, that was associated with this FLT3-ITD and NUP98 HOXD13 genotype. You can see when we take away the interferon-alpha receptor, you get uh, somewhat depletion of that pre-AML population. And then we saw downregulation of genes that are known to regulate hematopoietic stem cell self-renewal and leukemia self-renewal. So CDK6 has already been identified, for example, as a, a critical NUP98 NSD1 target. But then what about survival? Well, we crossed the, the we, we started looking at how these mice survived when we crossed them onto an interferon alpha receptor knockout background. We saw in our, in our model where we had um, the, this VAV1 creactivating the FLT3 ITD, we saw some modestly increased survival. We went back and tried to do the experiment in a different way that didn't necessarily put the mutations in every single cell in the mouse, so that we could maybe get a little bit more uh, dynamic range. And um, so we used, and, and we wanted to make it a little more step, stepwise. So we took NUP98 HOXD13 cells that had, you know, interferon receptor HET or, or knockouts. We transduced them with a FLT3 ITD virus. And you can see here, we get a pretty substantial extension of survival when you knock out the interferon alpha receptor. And importantly, when you do the same thing and you delete uh, the RUNX1, uh, we, we had to do the experiment a little bit different way because the alpha receptor and RUNX1 are tightly linked on chromosome 16, so we can never get double knockouts. Um, so we used a, a guide RNA to delete RUNX1 on these different backgrounds. You can see there's no difference in that. This is a very pediatric specific vulnerability. We've already started work on other cooperating mutations. So as I said, FLT3ITD is one mutation that cooperates with NUP98 uh, translocations. NRAS is another. Um, and once again, you see very strong activation of the interferon signal, specifically when you have these cooperating mutations. So this seems to be a common output for cooperating mutations and the, the NUP98 HOXD13 or the NUP98 translocation. A quick summary of where we're at right here. So I've, I've shown you that FLT3ITD cooperates with Hox, NUP98 HOXD13 to reprogram hematopoietic progenitors and hyperactivate the type 1 interferon signal. Um, these changes are unique to the interactions with the NUP98 translocation. They're not evident in, in a more adult biased uh, profile. Um, and then, you know, I think this represents a, a potential vulnerability for these super high risk leukemias because the interferon signaling pathway is targetable. There are monoclonal antibodies to it. Signal transduction is through a protein, a uh, jack like protein called TIC2, and there's inhibitors to that that have been used in uh, autoimmune disorders. And so I think, you know, we're trying, we're, we're starting to move towards thinking about clinical translation with this uh, discovery. Um, I still think that there's some outstanding questions like, does the age of mutation acquisition matter? Um, and is it restricted to these specific NUP98 fusions or are there other NUP98 fusions? So, you know, I think one of the takeaways then of, of what I've shown you is that, that it's really important to consider the effects of age. It's really important to consider the diversity of mutations that, that uh, children develop or adults develop and not just think of them as sort of monolithic entities where it's a NUP98 mutated leukemia or it's a FLT3ITD mutated leukemia or a DNMT3A mutated leukemia. And then we got to keep the cell of origin in mind too. And where this gets difficult then from a modeling standpoint is I, that was like four years worth of work and, and tons of crosses for basically one vulnerability and, and one, you know, a couple combinations of mutations. And so we need ways to up our throughput if we're going to cope with the genetic diversity that's out there. Um, there are so many different fusions that can drive pediatric leukemia, and in aggregate, they account for a substantial percentage of the high-risk patients, but individually, they're pretty rare. They're underrepresented in our PDX repertoire. There are really no transgenic models, and you know, I 
will need multiple lifetimes if we were going to do this again for all of the potential drivers that we could be looking at in the driver interactions. And then we also want to keep in mind the fact that when the mutation gets turned on, that might really matter because you might have different effects on, on leukemogenesis if you turn it on in a neonate as compared to an adult. And just an example of that, this is previously published work from a group looking at a different fusion called a KMT2A fusion. It's uh, most heavily enriched in infants, though it does cause some adult leukemias. And we wanted to see whether the age mattered. And so we developed, again, another uh, multi-allele cross that allowed us, in this case, to have a tetracycline-inducible MLL-ENL. And then this, we were able to get blood-specific expression by taking a blood-specific Cre, turning on a Cre-inducible tetrans activator, and then basically turning on this MLL-ENL fusion at different stages of development. And what you can see is here is that despite comparable levels of MLL-ENL expression, irrespective of when we turned on the fusion protein. When we turn it on, basically before birth, you get a pretty highly penetrant leukemia. Strikingly, when you turn it on right at birth, then all the mice die, and they die pretty fast. So that is a highly penetrant in, uh, period. And then when we were turning on an eight-week-old adults, basically they'd express the mutation, I mean, they'd express the fusion, and they wouldn't get sick. And so when you turn it on, it matters. And so, you know, again, this is this was a lot of work on one mouse, but we got to figure out ways to generalize it. And so, what we've been doing in my lab, and these are the last two slides that we've um, that, that that's really preliminary work, is we've been developing a technique that I'm calling ICAMS. It stands for IPS derived chimeric AML models. And what we did is we crossed these same alleles. In this case, it's not MLL ENL; it's just the an FRT site that you can basically put any fusion into. But the, the principle is the same, that we'd have a Cre-inducible tetrans activator, and, and then you could have an IPS cell that had this, this FRT site in the Cal1A locus, and you could put in basically any fusion you want. So we crossed all these different alleles together, reprogrammed fibroblasts. Some of the cell lines also have this inducible FLT3 ITD. Some of them have an inducible NRAS G12D. We can put in any number of fusions, and the whole overarching goal is to basically study them all at some point. And then we take, instead of actually crossing them, we make chimeric mice. Um, and this saves us years of breeding because we can do all the work in a dish. And if we want to knock out a critical infector, we can knock it out in the IPS cell. You can see here when we put these into mice, we can make chimeras out of them. They have, a, in this case, a Cre-inducible GFP that you can see. And then, you know, in this case, I'm showing you mice that have a, a, a 98 NSD1 transgene knocked in. You can see very good expression of the transgene in the blood cells, um, specifically when they're not exposed to doxycycline, so we have some control over it. We can control when we're turning it on. And then this is the, the most gratifying thing. We can actually get leukemias from these mice. So in this case, I've got it crossed to, um, it, we've got iPS cells that either have a NUP90, I mean, have NUP98 NSD1 with either a FLT3 ITD or an NRAS. You can see the spleens are way big. We get somewhat different types of leukemias um, compared to our, our transgenic model that we were looking at. In fact, they have a little bit more differentiation and somewhat different surface marker expression, but we're getting AMLs out of these. And so now the, the, the long-term goal is to really you know, dive into this diversity a little bit more in, in simpler ways. Um, so uh, I just want to point out the people who have done the work. You know, Lee did all of that work that I was showing you on FLT3 ITD, the 98 HOXD13 and interferon regulation. Uh, Teresa O'Ward did the ML ENL work that I just showed. Elizabeth Denby in my lab has built all of these ICAMs that I just showed you. Will Young is my informaticist who's been you know, central to everything. And then, then Mike White helped with the ICAMs.